So tonight we're going to be talking about passive house, which has become creating a lot of interest um, in the building industry and amongst the public about a more efficient way to build. And tonight we've got some very good experts to come, local people, to come and talk to us about what they're doing um, in that space. So we have Lyndon Thorley, who's a local architect based in the inner west. I visited Lyndon's house recently as part of a Sustainable House Day tour with the Inner West Council, um, and it, it is, was really interesting to see. He's also a certified passive house designer. He specialises in, in the design and delivery of carefully crafted, high-performance houses, workplaces, learning and play spaces. He has over 15 years professional experience working on sustainable renovations in the Inner West and has designed and built his own house in Camperdown to the Passive House standard. We'll hear a bit more about that. So here's Lyndon. Next to Lyndon, we have Trent, who is a certified Passive House tradesman and co-director of Red Cedar Constructions. So his company is a leader in sustainable building and specialises in the delivery of Passive House projects and other sustainable and architect design buildings in Sydney, both new build and renovate renovations. And so what's interesting tonight is we're going to learn about doing passive house renovations. Um, a lot of passive house work up till now has been new builds um, and it's, it's, it's a different challenge to actually take an existing house and bring it up to um, passive house standard. And our third speaker on the end is Nick Southern, who I've known for quite a while. He's been involved in sustainable building for quite a few years. He was one of the first builders to use hempcrete in, in Sydney. He's done a lot of work in that space. Um, he's also a certified passive house tradesman. His company, Sound um, Building Solutions, specialises in building comfortable, healthy homes that are extremely energy efficient. And he also has done a lot of work in the inner west. So, Firstly, I'd like to introduce Lyndon to tell us about Passive House. When we did Passive House then? Before you even do the work. Well, um, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak. Um, I guess, um, yeah, look, my, my role with Passive House has been a relatively recent part of my career. Um, and something that we explored with our own house before we started to deliver it for other people. Um, and so I guess, um, in starting to deliver house houses for other people, something that we have engaged with all the way through my professional career is how we renovate essentially terrace houses in the inner west. And the fundamental issues that we deal with are very tight sites, um, usually poor moisture control, poor ventilation, poor orientation, um, and living in very close quarters with other people with aircraft models. Right. So we, we have to find ways to engage with that environment. Um, and, and for me, passive solar, whilst it's very, very important, it's the fundamentals of what we do with, um, with Passive House, it lacks a rigour and ability to test things as we implement it. Um, so... We, we need to, for me, it's very hard to tell someone that they can 
on a tight inner city site with no space around them, it's very hard for me to tell them that we can do appropriate orientation, ease windows that open for cross ventilation with aircraft noise and sirens and cars going past. And we've needed to find a different way of approaching renovations in this environment. So passive house is one way of doing that. And I think it's a very good way, um, mainly because it's incredibly rigorous. And instead of taking five or six principles, um, what, what we're actually doing is designing with those principles from the start and then we're modelling and testing whether those principles or those measures that we've implemented are doing something. So the final bit of what we end up with is an Excel spreadsheet with the heat losses and heat gains calculation. And when I make changes to the design, I can actually see what the difference is and measure the difference. Um, so that's why I'm particularly interested in passive house. So um, let's go with the presenter. We might have to do a presenter view on that. We're getting there. Anyway, yeah, I can talk to what's on the, the main slide here. So fundamentally, what passive house is, is it's an international standard for buildings of all types. It's not just houses. Any building can be a passive house. Um, also, importantly, um, the targets are the same across the world. So our energy consumption for heating, energy consumption for cooling, energy consumption for humidity and the amount of energy that we're allowed to use for the building annually per square metre is exactly the same whether we're in Antarctica or whether we're here in Sydney in a nice benign climate. The thing that changes is our building envelope and we scale it to suit the climate and the conditions that we're working with. Um, here in Sydney, that's very good news because we're in a very, very nice climate and it's very, very easy to live up. Um, as a house building, we don't need to change a lot if we were to uh, So, Passive House is based on passive solid design principles. As I said, it goes further by adding measurable performance criteria. Um, the building um, forms the scale to the climate. And really what we're targeting is building that stays at 20 to 25 degrees C and 57 percent humidity with very minimal energy requirements to achieve this year round. Whether you, in your passive house, choose to live in those conditions all the time, it's up to you. But what we're trying to do as a designer, we're trying to design a building and model it to meet that performance. And then these guys are trying to build that. Um, and we have a very important additional step to all of this, which is the Passive House Certifier, who's a third party independent and checking what I'm doing as a designer and checking what these guys are doing as a building and verifying that we've actually done what we said we are going to do. What that means is that when you compare passive houses um, model performance versus their actual performance, there's a very, very tight range of variability there, whereas on a lot of the other ways of approaching net, new net zero buildings, um, we're not quite as tight a range. So I think that's quite important. Um, Something that's important to stress about passive houses is that they do use heating and cooling. And in Australia and much of the world, we use reverse cycle air conditioning to do that. Um, the difference is that because the building envelope performance is really good, like we need um, TNT light candles to heat 30 square meter room, um, you need very reliable air conditioning. Um, and in the case of my experience living in this house is that we really need even if we cool the house in the summer during the day before the sun's out and we're drawing um, from our renewable energy um, on site and then we um, 
in winter or this time of year we've been presenting with energy um, and in winter we're using a little bit but we never actually turn a heater on the fact that we are living in the house we're cooking we have our appliances is enough to keep the building temperature pretty close to range for me personally i find 20 to 25 degrees is a couple of degrees higher than i need 18 to 23 degrees is where i feel comfortable in the house um, and so we probably spend a little bit more on our energy in summer and use a lot less in winter. Um, yeah, we'll do Q&A at the end. We'll try to keep it moving because I'm a little bit behind now that we've yeah, got slides running. So um, next slide. Um, so principles of passive house are... Um, the, Okay, the five principles of passive house are continuous insulation. So unlike a minimum compliance in, here in Australia, what we're trying to do is make sure that we have a even, nice, heavy lay, layer of insulation around all parts of the building. Um, we want to minimise our thermal bridges, so that means we don't have steel going from inside to out. Um, and it means that masonry is protected on the edge, so a slab will have slab edge insulation. Um, we have the main reason for the both of those is that as you seal the building up, as you make it better insulated, the track for energy to pass through um, through the um, building envelope becomes much longer, and the chances of you getting condensation increase. So. We have to be very careful not to have gaps and not to allow places to come to too quick for that. Um, so, uh, the next principle is high performance windows. So, generally, what we're looking for is a window that has a decent amount of meat to it so that it, it actually performs relatively well. Windows are the weakest point of the building. In Sydney, we're often talking double glaze. Much of the colder parts of Australia, we're heading towards triple glaze. Um, oh, yeah. Do you want me to do it? Um, yep. You want to go so right? we're generally using UPVC windows or timber windows that have an aluminium external clay. Um, the really, really important function of these windows alongside their insulated, insulation value is that they also seal really well when, when we close them up. Um, that's so that when you close the house, it's actually closed and you have a really good airtight environment inside where we can control the internal environment. So, the next principle is airtight construction. In a new house, we target 0.6 air chambers an hour. Um, in a retrofit, which is known as an inner fit, we targeted one air change an hour. To give some context to this, um, NATHERS in modeling assumes 12 air, air changes an hour. I believe testing on that suggests that the average new house delivers more like 16 air changes an hour. So we're going for a tiny, tiny level of infiltration compared to what the building code requires of us. Um, the reason why we're doing that is because it allows us to control our internal air environment. Um, and when we can do that, we can then use mechanical recovery ventilation. This one scares people because they the context of it is that, oh God, I've closed up all my windows, I've sealed up my house. I've got no air. That is absolutely not the case. What we're doing is we're using a fresh air system to deliver fresh air. Usually, three. Um, we change the total volume of air in a house three times an hour, um, and we essentially supply fresh air to living rooms and bedrooms. We suck out of the kitchen and bathrooms so that we're taking odors and moist air out of the living space. Um, the really great thing about mechanical heat recovery ventilation is that we can filter that air as it comes in. Um, and we can also retain 90% plus of heat that leaves the building and transfer it onto fresh air coming in. So that, that's basically removed the need for heating in winter. 
in the Sydney climate. Um, in summer, we, can, we can't cool the building using that, but we can strip humidity and we can strip heat off the air. And it means that we're our starting point for what we're heating and cooling is you know, five to 10 degrees cooler and we've probably knocked off again five to 15% humidity, um, which in February, March period is absolutely amazing. Um, <laughs> So next slide here, we've got an example of air tight, air tightness measures. In Sydney, we put it on the internal side of the insulation. Um, so if you're inside of the house, in this case, we've used a OSB board as our air tight layer, and we've run the tape across all of the joints. We also have some membrane that we've used. This can be used against the stud wall um, across the whole expanse of wall or ceiling as well. Um, and again, the tape of joints. Uh, so that's a, it's a vapor permeable membrane, but it's air tight. It's great. Um, of course, the other side here is the boiler door test grid um, that we use to test our air tightness. This is something that I believe is fundamentally missing from our National Construction Code process. Um, what we do is we depressurize the building and pressurize the building to test what the average infiltration and exfiltration of the building is at 50 pascals. Um, and that's that 0.6 or 0 0.1 air change that we're, we're targeting. Next slide. Uh, uh, this is what a mechanical recovery ventilation system looks like. In this case, it's in the laundry. I've shown you a part of a simple one because it helps to explain what's happening. Um, this is the box, there's a filter at its side. We also have, this is the sound attenuator, and on the supply side, we have another box up here where we can put a pepper filter in, which filters out. Um, we put that in on a smoky day, um, or for equal day. It will reduce the performance of the hip recovery ventilation, but it stops our house from having a smoky um, smell on it. Um, we have fat insulated pipes that communicate to the outside. We have skinny guts that go to each of the rooms um, and some of them supplies to be on the Simple explanation to that. Here we have some examples of high performance windows. Big difference is that we have two steps, two seals. Um, we have warm edge double glazed spaces, not aluminium, so plastic and aluminium. Um, single or triple, oh, sorry, triple or double glazed windows. And on the outside, these ones have an aluminium cladding, which takes out our maintenance of single windows. Um, Sydney climate, we usually use a 68 mil frame. All the time, we go to an 88 mil frame. Um, so, can you open the windows? Yes, absolutely. We do it when it's nice. So, when you're at home and it's a nice sunny day, you want to hear the birds throw everything open. Um, the important bit is that we close it and when it's closed, we hear a lot less. We have complete control of our internal air environment. We don't have humidity um, from outside coming through the window gas. So as I mentioned, it's the third part of the sort of You'll see shortly as to how many materials and ways we can actually make passive house work. Um, preliminary design 
bond review is always done by an independent passive certifier. Um, and the construction process is overseen by the passive certifier. And as we're going through the job, we're collecting all that data to actually hand to them so that they can actually certify it at the end. Um, the air tightness of the building in the envelope, we test sort of three times just before we run services, power, um, uh, water. As we sort of get to the end where we've lined the walls of the plasterboards, they will check. And then the final one at the end, which is where we get our accreditation from. Uh, and then test results, photos, confirming the construction and data, they're all uploaded to Germany. So it's not some sort of, you know, um, half-baked certification. There's a lot of documentation that goes into finalising that certification. Next one, right? All right, what are the uh, benefits of living in a passive house? Um, what it does, passive house are very energy efficient house. So on the macro sort of level, you're, uh, you're taking away how much energy you need to draw from the grid and, um, and so on. So that's good there. As a homeowner, it's delightful. <laughs> So I've recently finished my own house, my family home. My wife is so happy. That's, that's the most important thing. We get up in the morning at the moment and it's, what, six degrees outside. It's still just under 20 degrees inside our house. So you get up, you get ready, go to work. One of the problems is you walk outside and you forget how cold it is outside, so you're quickly running back into... Uh, Go and get your jacket. Um, another example. So the guys that work with me, we've built two unifed renovation standard passive houses so far. They don't really get to see it when it's in a lived-in condition or more to the point, feel it when it's in a lived-in condition. And I had everyone over last week doing some work and everyone's coming in the morning and they're like, this really works. Like it was the, the penny drop moment. Forum and they're like, wow, this is, this is so comfortable in here. Um, but of course, my wife is very happy. Who wants coffee? Um, one of the sales points to my wife on building this way as well, you're building an airtight house, which means nothing can get in that you don't want getting in. We all live in Sydney. Sydney is known for things about that big, cockroaches. We don't have them in our house because they can't get in unless you leave the door wide open. So that's another comfort factor. Um, you don't have to worry about the energy bills, which is delightful. We've got a bus route outside our house. You don't hear it. So our old house, everything used to rattle when every, whenever a truck or something would go past. So it's, it's really comfortable. Looking forward to my first energy bill because the old ones were atrocious. Um, two small kids trying to stop them from freezing to death um, or boiling to death. So looking forward to that. Um, yeah, so, so the next thing we want to talk about is kind of why a passive house makes sense in the inner west. Um, my experience is building on a 156 square metre site in Camperdown. We've got about eight metres of frontage. We have, we're in the AF 20 25 noise contour for the flight path. We have a major tertiary hospital a couple of blocks away. We have fire and police in the street and uni accommodation at the other. So, this is our site analysis presented with our DA council. Um, so, we have a a building that had an approved third story going to Lewis. This is the winter sun angle. So we have another winter sun. Um, we have something by the equinox and too much by the, by the time we have sun, uh, summer um, sun. We're incredibly close quarters to three houses. Um, so you know, leaving windows open just isn't an option. Um, 
while we're sleeping. Um, it's not ideal while we're awake either a lot of the time. Um, and for an aircraft noise point of view, I already needed to go to higher performance windows to get acoustic ratings on the glass. I needed to increase my insulation. I needed to increase my latest plasterboard. I needed an air conditioner. Um, and so when we looked at what we could do, we were sort of 80% of the way towards passive house. So normally when we're talking about passive house additional costs, um, from going from a standard construction to a passive house, 200 square metre project home kind of a build on a flat site with no constraints, we're talking about an 10% in cost. It is roughly where that's been modelled. Um, in my case, we delivered a passive house standing for about 2% additional to what I was going to do anyway. So the matrix is a lot better when you have council requirements that raise what you're doing. Um, so as I said, passive solar doesn't necessarily work particularly well in this environment. It can work, it's just it doesn't work really well. Minimum standards ratchet up what we've got to do anyway. Um, the other really, really important thing about passive house design is that it's, it's design agnostic. They don't really care what materials you have on the front of your house. They don't really care about whether, like what roof form you have. It's more whether or not you can get the performance to stack up with the design. So there are still things we need to do. We still need orientation, but we don't need a great big if We can actually do a a blind that cuts the sun when we need it and that can work just as well and in a really tight environment like we've got that helps us get our winter sun in and gets light in during winter but in summer I can use that blind to cut the light. Um, the other thing that for me with 50, sort of 13 years of experience designing passive solar um, buildings I was noticing that the buildings that we're designing have better and better windows, they have better and better insulation. We're getting to a point where I don't actually know how airtight a building is because we don't have a blower door test requirement on us. And I'm conscious that the buildings, as that performance goes up, that we're going to hit a threshold where sick building syndrome becomes a problem. And I think you need to start to manage that. Passive house is one way of doing it, and it's a very stepwise rigorous way of managing it. So a huge proportion of people that I talk to in the West at the moment are talking to me about mold and that they're getting on their masonry walls. It's probably because they've got high humidity, gas heating, gas cooking, um, and very cold walls. And so there's a dew point occurring on those walls and condensation is forming and that's becoming mold. So for me, ventilation, is incredibly important in the way that we approach houses in the West, whether we're passive house or not. Um, so approach your regulations, um, it, it's very much um, site specific. So, you know, you need to look at the existing building, what the site constraints are, its location, uh, especially the design brief of the client. Um, and that will drive the ideal way to actually build a passive house. Um, the chosen approach and building form uh, heavily affects that uh, cost and performance because what will work on one job won't work on the other, cranes, those sorts of things. Uh, and it's just important to tailor that project and between the architect and the builder because when you're when you've got those guys on site early or you know, in talks early, you're able to sort of go through the you know, mix of the different options you've got to actually create that passive house work. Um, and then, you know, you're sort of going to alleviate the potential for risk if you're using unfamiliar materials and equipment because that can drive up the price, obviously. Um, and then the experience of your team, uh, it, you know, it's obviously important um, with anything, experience is everything, but... When it comes to passive house, it's a lot more. Um, there's just 
so many things that you just learn along the way, especially when it comes to the renovation style of things. Wow. You want to go to the next one? Right. So what we want to do now is take you through a few different examples of projects that we've all worked on um, and show, really reinforce that idea of there are different ways of achieving passive house. As I said before, because it's design agnostic, you can do anything you want to. The key difference is that the cost is very, very scalable based on what you choose to do. And choosing the right approach for a site is really, really important. Um, and getting the form factor and your building team very clear on what we're trying to do so that we can take risk out of this process. Um, so this house is my own house in Gapadown. Um, it's, it's a new house and it's a very unique opportunity in the inner west to be able to build a new house. We're showing it tonight because it's, it's one approach to a renovation. The benefit of it is, is that we can do whatever we want. We can keep everything, walls can go wherever we want. We've managed every problem. We've taken out a lot of risks. Um, the very big downside of that is that we chuck the whole house away beforehand. Um, so go on to the next slide. Um, on my site, we've, we're not strictly heritage, um, but we are in a heritage conservation zone. Um, and we have very important ones that you very close to it. So I took that side very, very seriously. We've used brick as a cladding. It has no structural birth, but it literally just cladding um, against the, to blending with the adjacent brick buildings down the street. Um, we've then chosen materials that we can see in the hot spots of the lane um, and tried to introduce them into our building in a very neat new way because whilst this is a heritage streetscape, this is a new element we wanted to read as a new element, but sit very, very calmly in that streetscape. So all of the lines in this building match up with adjacent lines on adjacent buildings. Um, the materials are all evident in the streetscape already. Um, so we, yeah, the difference is that it's, it's clearly in the house, it's in the straight and get it done. <laughs> um, so uh, if we go to the next slide. Sorry. It's an internet connection is the problem, sorry. Um, it just keeps dropping out, unfortunately. So in terms of passive house approach, this could have been a 140 mil stick frame or it could be a SIPS building. We chose a SIPS building to learn. Um, the thing that we learned about doing a SIPS building on a site like this is that we didn't actually have enough room to do a SIPS building well with this title. Um, and so doing this again, I probably would stick, stick to just doing a traditional stick frame. Um, and that would take us back to fairly standard insulation materials. And for a builder that I'm taking that to, that's a lot more comfortable than a known quantity. And we've taken some perceived risk out of contract that translates the money. Um, other than kind of the choice of materials and what we're doing with the house, um, from a passive house point of view, this is a very normal design. What we're trying to do is create a large private living space that's wrapped around a courtyard. The courtyard is giving us light um, through its own bedrooms up here, living space down here, kitchen down here. Um, we've got a deck here, which is mainly about veggie garden, but primarily about six things in the back garden. This courtyard gives light to this house at the back, that's a living room and also to another house behind us. Um, so there's a level of generosity to, that we could deliver because we're doing a new house. We couldn't do that if we were renovating the old house because we wouldn't have been allowed to concentrate our space in this way. Um, so from a design point of view, that's, that works very well. As I said before, we don't have any eaves because I want to be able to get lighting. So we have a great big line that covers this four windows all in one here. And another one for this tall window, and another one for this. That takes out 86% of my solar heat gain when those blinds are down, and I can still see through them. 
through the blind, it's fine. Um, they've got this on the outside of the glass instead of the inside, so it's stopping that solar heat gain. Uh, what's next? Inside, we've got 156 square meter site. We've got 156 square meters of house. We've maximized the amount of space that we could have internally. And the way that that has worked for us, we needed a, fa a family home, um, three bedrooms, three bathrooms, a guest bedroom slash study, plus a decent size living space. The way that we got that to work really well was we did quite small rooms and we used our available height um, and our access to that courtyard that we created um, to be able to get light in lots of places, get views to the next room. Um, this is our um, staircase right in the middle of the house. We have a great big window that we can sell into sun. That runs us off this white wall. It lights the darkest bit of the house in the middle. Um, that's, that's down in that space. So using space really effectively is very, very important for tight in the lesser sites. And that's primarily when you're going to do a renovation project, I think the design needs to be really focusing on that as well as getting energy performance and doing right. Um, next, uh, so, yeah. So this is a bit of a snapshot of, we've been in our house for now for a year and a bit. Um, this is a snapshot from a couple of weeks ago of um, how our energy performance runs. Um, this was May 2nd. This is the data that we get from our heat recovery ventilation unit. So the outdoor air temperature in the morning was 13.9 degrees and 68% humidity. This was one of those really cold mornings with the Arctic blast that came through. Oh, so Antarctic blast. Um, so air temperature was actually more like eight degrees. It's just by the time it's the machine, that's what it is. Um, the air, so the air that's been supplied into the house is this figure here. So 20.5 degrees up from 13.9, and we've reduced the humidity from 68 to 50%. Um, by the time it's gone through the house and it's coming back out um, again, so that gives the best read of what our internal air conditions, um, internal conditions are. We're 20.9 degrees because we've got some clients eating body heat and someone's got to have a shower. Um, and we've gained 6% humidity, uh, but we've saved nice and dry. The air that we're exhausting out of the building, because we're recovering that, putting it on there, it's 15.5 degrees, and we stripped a whole bunch of humidity. Um, so the energy required to run this machine is about the same as, as a downline. Um, so it's a very, very efficient machine, and it's saving us huge amounts of energy. Over here is the 24 hour period for our. Um, our Tesla Powerwall. Um, we were 81% self sufficient for energy, um, and we got 43% of our needs out of our 11 solar panels on the roof. Um, we ended the day with a full battery, um, and we used that through the evening um, to do our cooking and run everything. Um, there was a need to get about 19% of our power from the roof. When I go and compare that to um, what my energy provider is telling me that we we did for the day. Um, that 19% was 1.65 kilowatt hours of energy. Um, so total this goes somewhere around um, uh, eight to nine kilowatt hours of energy a day. We exported 0.21 kilowatt hours of energy to the grid. To me, that is a perfect scenario because I'm not that interested in exporting any power to the grid. I'm more interested in what I can generate and use or generate and store and use later. Um, so. This is our second example. This is a project that Trent and I are working on together. Um, so this one is in the eastern suburbs. Um, unlike my house where we just demolished everything, um, this house, we had council constraints that required us to match our attached neighbour. Um, we had to keep existing sandstone footings and we had to keep existing external brick walls. Um, this house wasn't designed for plastic house, but it became one. Um, 
the biggest change that that brought about was that the internal brick walls also got pulled down. Um, now, this approach is good because councils do require you to do this and it worked in this circumstance. The con of it is that trans team spent a huge amount of time trying to work with fairly degraded brickwork that probably hampers our energy consumption of the life of the building. Um, and it introduced a big unknown quantity. So we had to do it in this case. It works and it's going to be a very, very nice house. Um, but this is one of those things where we're going to take the experience of working on this and we will approach the early stages of a similar design slightly differently and probably present our arguments to council slightly differently to try and get a different result. Um, but this will work for many of the worst renovations that we do. Um, so next slide, please. So here is our neighbour, and this is what we're starting with. We needed to follow their form factor. This is the house that we started with. And this is the house now, um, almost complete. Um, so we've matched in very well with the streetscape. Um, there's very little that identifies it as being an eco building or a, you know, passive solar building with soaring eaves and, and the like. It sits calmly in that streetscape. Um, and for me, that's a very big plus. I'm not that interested in buildings that really um, are out there. We want buildings that make a good community in good streets. Um, so we're going to mix it. So, um, so this, this design brief really was can we make the backyard a little bit bigger? Can we get some height? Um, can we get some light in? Um, so we took a very large bathroom out the back that blocked the view to the backyard and we just put that in the underneath the staircase and put a staircase in. Kitchen stayed pretty much where it was and we've made a big living dining area. And then the most important thing for this house, because it's next to a single storey neighbour, which is going to go up sooner or later, we've got a great big void and really lovely big windows up above it, which give it wings of sun forever. So we breathe from the backyard, we crept back 600 millimetres. It's not a lot, but it's, it's a game and it's something that feels very nice as part of this design. Um, so we'll the next slide. So this is that great big window. Um, we have some kids studies here. We have bedrooms for the kids at this end. And then we have a family bathroom followed by um, the main bedroom and ensuite. Um, we're managing the filtering of um, adjoining neighbors and views in lots of different ways. So we've got this external screen. We then have an external Blind, which is covering that 86% heat gain again. We have a roof garden which will be planted with shrubs. Um, we then will have a translucent blind on the inside as well. And by the time we have lots of different layers, we've ended up with something that's very private, but also has views out and has a grace and an elegant story, which is very important. Um, this is almost finished, um, main bedroom at the front. Um, with the power us, again, we're working with really small areas for bedrooms. So little things like bay windows that push out and give you somewhere to sit, but don't extend the room everywhere by a metre means that we can have um, a smaller footprint building. And through good design, then we've delivered a space that works really, really well, despite being small. Um, thanks, Lyndon. Um, this is actually my brother's place. Uh, it's not in the inner west, but it is, in, uh, it is in Kellyville. But I thought it'd be good to showcase because it's actually one that's going to be different to the others that are in this um, uh, group because we've actually applied the uh, insulation of the outside. Um, so it was an existing rectangular building, so uh, it was the perfect home to come along and add a um, you know, bolt on some extra rooms and make it a passive house. Um, it's, it's 
probably a bit more of one of the more cost-effective ways of doing it because the internal linings of and, and, and many of the walls, if you'd like them to stay there, don't need to be touched. Uh, as long as you've got the structure internally that you'd like, then that can all remain the same or only adding to the external. Um, con, it may not work in the inner west all that time because the freestanding buildings aren't as prevalent, but at the same time, it was, um, yeah, it's just, they still are around. Um, this is the original house. It was, it's a perfect rectangle. Um, so the brick with the uh, rendered place with a uh, concrete slab and concrete roof tiles. Um, if you could just go to the next slide. So here's the front door now. Uh, all the double glazed windows have been put in. Uh, this is actually the uh, airtight wrap here. That's a rigid insulation board. And so all that's just been built up on top of the actual external part of the building. Nothing internally is happening from an airtight perspective. Um, this photo here shows the actual um, new kitchen, living, dining being attached to the back of the rear existing part of the house. And basically that's the external wrap or airtight wrap coming down from upstairs and attaching to my sit panel. So I've used a sit panel roof there, which is really handy and, and quick to install. Um, those sorts of things are really uh, a good bonus to use if you can, if you've got a straightforward roof, they're very quick to use. Um, this is a new kitchen living dining added to the back. It's more of a, I suppose you call it a traditional passive house build where it's stick timber frame, insulated, cavity on the inside, airtight on the inside, weatherproof membrane on the external, cladding buttons, cladding. Uh, as you can see here, that's the sit there. So you've got insulation in the middle, the metal roof's on top, and there's a metal, um, there's a metal uh, finish underneath. Um, the next photo shows obviously that cutting added to it. So basically, um, so it's gone from brickwork, the airtight layer, the insulation, and then we've added cladding patterns and the cladding. So you're just you now typically looking at a nice Pampton style, if you want to call that, uh, looking home um, that's highly performing. Uh, and as you'll see there, there's just um, that last photo there shows the kitchen installed. Um, those sit panels you can actually buy with a um, V-joint groove in them. So that's actually all exposed and um, it's quite a nice finish. Um, thank you. All right, the uh, Annandale Ennefer. Now, this is the first Ennefer that we did, and it's in a heritage conservation zone. It's a big old terrace. It's quite a grand home. Uh, there was loads of mould problems with it. There was, we actually did a blower door test. Or, sorry, we attempted to do a blower door test at the start, and we couldn't actually get a proper reading. It was that leaky. So the consultant says, oh, well, it's a bit over 20 somewhere. But something was flapping and we couldn't get a proper reading. Um, the approach. So we weren't changing too much of the structure. At the back part of the house, we did. But for the main part, it was kept as is. Um, but what we did, we insulated all the existing brickwork, which was 230, so there was no cavity. So 130-year-old building. So we uh, insulated it with wood fibre board. Um, the reason behind that, it's a big house. You could, you could lose that much space, sorry, that much space on the inside because there was enough room. Um, and you preserve the outside of the building because that's the conservation side of things. Um, it's fantastic acoustically. And when you touch the walls, it's another thing with a passive house. All your internal surfaces are supposed to be over 17 degrees or at 17 no, degrees. No more than 4.2 degrees difference between air temperature and surface. And then when seated, no more than one degree difference between feet and shoulders. Um, so you're talking super tight range um, with a tile floor um, um, of the concrete slab in our house. And we're walking on a night there for the summer year. 
So these are a big advantages. The con with this approach is the wood fire and when you're putting it on the inside of the wall, it does have to be adhered 100%. So it's quite a labor intensive process. Um, next one. Next one. So there's uh, one of my apprentices, Evan. And as you can see, there's a lot of glue that goes on because you do not want any air behind that because you're trying to take, take out the condensation risk that's there. So you are going onto the wall and you're also going onto the board and then it gets pushed off. You also come around afterwards and they get screw fixings, which are these big insulated screws that go in so you don't get thermal bridging coming through the brickwork to the surface. This is why we uh, we kept the house as it is, because it is an absolutely gorgeous house. Um, the windows we had recreated as close as we could get them to what weren't the actual original windows in the house. The fireplace has also been dealt with as well. So, you can't use that fire anymore. It's all blocked up. But the chimney stack we actually used as a void for running our services. And that's all part of the insulated layer as well. We did insulate the um, party wall. And a lot of that was for acoustics as well because the, um, the neighbour did enjoy playing games and got quite rowdy. Um, <laughs> I think something really important to note about that last slide is that those great heritage style windows, um, tilted. They're, they're tilted and so they're cracked open at the moment, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. on the top right there, right there, up there, but still present as the heritage property. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, it's still there. And this is the uh, the fire pit that we had this is the very large kitchen that was created. We've actually gone with cork floors there and the borer. So that's a reticulation induction. The carbon filters are sort of in that hole. Really like this as a solution compared to something like a Mille because you can dissipate all that reticulated air across that full length of the joinery underneath and it comes out the kickboard just above the top instead of having it shooting out in one board. So it's, it is very comfortable. One thing to note about the range of this from the type building, if we're sucking out huge amounts of energy outside, then we create a pressure differential and everything stops working. So you've got to think very carefully about the ventilation, as you mentioned. And the next project, so this is our main benefit. This is actually my own home. Um, we've done a mixture of internal stico on the original. 1884 walls and then at the back section of the house where it was 270 brickwork done in the 80s we decided that we'd actually knock them down because it's going to be quicker for us to build 90 mil stud walls and insulate with wood fibre on the outside plus we also gained about that much more space internally by reducing those walls and putting in high performance walls. Um, the 90 mil stud wall, it's very easy for any builder to work with. So I had guys which had never worked on Passive House working with me and they got it, they were like, just 90 mil stud wall. Yeah, that's easy, Nick. let's get on with it. And then um, when we put on the wood fibre on the outside, my neighbour was gracious enough to help me one Saturday and we clad, and he's not a builder by any, by any means, um, and we clad most of the northern side, so three floors, just the two of us. It goes on super quick, which is one of the massive, massive pros for wood fibre because you get a lot of insulation and it's totally firmly broken around the outside of your building. You can you know, clad it, which we did upstairs. That's some of the inside. So this is inside. So this is upstairs. So we actually ran battens down here 
And then we plot that, we plot the text. In the lower section on the right hand side, we rendered that. So we used line based render because we want it to be vapor open, that water type as well. Um, what you can see in the middle photo there, because we had an existing slab, which was an infill slab, we had to actually deal with uh, termites and thermal bridging coming in. We couldn't put external insulation on the slab edge because we weren't pouring a new slab. So we've come in horizontally and then I put a top and slab over the top of that where we used uh, Boral and Vizier, which is very low carbon concrete. And uh, we polished that. So there are different ways of tackling how you can do your, your thermal bridging and that was the way that we uh, tackled that one there. We've got some of the different wall build-ups on the next slides. So we had three main wall build-ups. There was the internal um, wood fibre, there was the external rendered wood fibre, and then we also had the, uh, the cladding over the top of the wood fibre on the 90 mil stud walls. Um, another thing with the windows in a passive house, they have to go on your insulated layer. And when you're using 90 mil stud work and wood fibre, you can put them anywhere because that's all insulation. And where we've got wood fibre on stud walls, we do have a uh, service cavity with a layer, layer of Intello, which is our uh, air type wrap on the ones. These are some finishes. So over here, that's chip rock and it's standard. Everyone knows how to work with it. Um, in the stairwell, that's actually lime render and then lime plaster. We haven't been filling that in the joinery, we just haven't quite got there yet. And there's our polished slab that we've used with uh, low carbon concrete from Boral and Physio. And we walk around this house barefoot. I just noticed my child's hiding down there as <laughs> well. <laughs> Enjoying it. Um, yeah, so it's just such a comfortable house to live in. <laughs> so, um, just a little bit. Uh, I want to stress that from, from my perspective, I think that passive house is a very good idea. Um, I like the, the rigor of it. It scaffolds things and it makes sure that we limit the chance of any mistakes that happen. Um, there are times where we can't quite get there. And that might be because of budget, it might be because of council constraints, and it might be because of site constraints. Um, so I wanted to in what I have to say with talking about what we can do as a starting point. So the first measure here is something that you don't need me or these guys involved particularly with. You can coordinate this yourself, which is just getting rid of the gas connection. Induction cooking, reverse cycle AC, heat pump hot water, solar PV and battery are all very good measures to improve the sustainability behind energy efficiency and thermal comfort. The reason why we use reverse cycle air conditioning rather than gas heating or cooling is that one unit of energy equals somewhere between three and five units of heat output from a reverse cycle air conditioner. If we're talking about gas, it's one to one. So, and that's before we start talking about air quality issues or anything else, um, moisture that comes from the gas. So um, these are things that highly recommend that people start thinking about implementing in their homes. Um, thermal performance, you can put in, you can back out your roof and put in your insulation up there at a, at a very approachable cost. Um, depending on how handy you are, you might be able to do some of that yourself. Obviously, there are important considerations around electricity and working near wires that mean that you should do that with a very careful approach and ideally some trades who know what they're doing. Um, gap sealing. Again, it starts to really help things, um, and it's unlikely that you're going to take a fairly standard house up to a point where it's becoming dangerous 
with anything you might do. Um, the next big ticket one, which um, someone in the audience mentioned that they've done recently, is, is a window upgrade. Um, conventional aluminium windows, in my opinion, are a thing of the past, and I have no intention of putting them in houses anymore. Aluminium conducts heat at 300 times the rate of timber. Um, and UPVC or a timber clad, uh, sorry, timber frame potentially with aluminium cladding is, is where the performance is. Um, and increasingly, the price point is very approachable as well. Um, you're looking for things like double glazing with a warm edge spacer, nice tight seals. Passive house certification is a very good indicator of whether it was a good one or not. Um, uh, generally, you need a thicker frame in order to perform well. Skinny little frames are problematic. Um, so it changes the way a window looks. Really big windows with a thick frame look just fine. They're just different to little windows with skinny frames. Um, as I said earlier, building ventilation is something I talk to a lot of potential clients about. Um, we have very poor ventilation. We usually have very high humidity due to either rising depth or roof leaks or leaks around windows or just condensation. Um, increasing that ventilation is an important step. Um, one of those steps is decentralised heat recovery ventilation, which is paired fans that run in opposite directions. Um, and they, they draw air through your house. Um, another option is a centralised heat recovery ventilation unit, which pumps air into bedrooms, sucks out of bathrooms and kitchens. Um, you're not going to get massive gain in terms of your heat recovery like we're getting in an airtight building, but you are going to get a much higher rate of ventilation through your house, better fresh air and some filtration. And that's yeah. relatively close to in your house. Um, Finally, this is an area that I am trying to engage with in a big way at the moment. Um, I've always seen that hers is problematic to the th things that I'm really interested in doing. Um, that is our minimum code compliance tool. Um, so that when you get into looking at it, it can be used in a, like a much broader way. Um, it can be in the net zero tool. And if you use it as a design tool, you can model the performance of a house and you can work out how to make that work very well. So the things that I would be targeting if I'm not targeting passive house is eight stars plus, six to eight air changes an hour, and most importantly, requiring lower door testing during construction to make sure that we haven't sealed the building up too much and with the full intention that we come in and do destructive um, work to the airtight or the building wraps um, or junction in somewhere um, to increase airflow if we've made the building too airtight. Um, so, yeah, an airtight building without proper ventilation and proper condensation management is going to be a very, very unhealthy building to live in. So, yeah, but using that as a design tool, working with it positively and well is a very good thing to do. Okay, um, from the three of us, we just want to make sure that um, got some messages to take home. Um, as we've explained over the five approaches, there's so many like, different ways to achieve passive house. Um, I mean, I spoke to a, an electrician who came through a building of ours the other day. He was doing it through uh, tilt slabs. So, um, you know, it's anything goes. Um, Costs can vary significantly. Um, I've done one where we actually did it for nothing. We just did it on the, we created a different design and actually got it in on budget. Uh, I've had others go to about 10, 11%. But, you know, when you've got all the constraints of aircraft noise and heritage going to add cost to your building anyway, you know, your, your building is going to be expensive anyway. Um, you know, the experience of the three of us up here and the other guys amongst the actual passive house uh, industry, um, everyone's always talking because it is new to, you know, Australia, Sydney, um, but will be the way in the future because we are starting to tighten up our buildings. We are starting to create better performing buildings. So, 
And as, uh, as Nick said, they're just super comfortable living, uh, tight comfort thermal range, minimal energy consumption, you know, filtered, dry, mold-free area. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's it from us. Thank you. You know, there's questions, which are all this wonderful audience for you who have got, uh, I'm sure, some uh, waiting to ask some questions. You should put it aside. Oh, I was interested that you say that you, you made um, holes in the building where it's too airtight at uh, the end there. Uh, why do you need to build it too airtight when you have to finish the ventilation on the window? How do you know? Um, so, according to International, the relevant international standard, which I can't remember the number of. Um, basically, between one air change and three air changes an hour is particularly dangerous. Uh, under six air changes, we want to talk about adding a mechanical ventilation. Um, six air changes and above, we're comfortable with natural filtration. Um, but you know, if you look at countries like the UK and New Zealand, where they've gone to start to seal up buildings, they've ratcheted up their minimum standards. They've all ended up in this territory of buildings that land in that one to three air changes now. Um, so as of us, the whole intent of it is that we've designed it well enough and managed it well enough that we comfortably pass that danger zone and pick up a mechanical fresh air. And we've kept it very, very safe. Um, so. mm -hmm. Uh, not really good enough, and uh, you might be good. <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah, much, that's right. Yeah. Or, or yeah, good yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. My question so, uh, we have multiple climates in our universe with us, uh, like we have global warming limit up to 1.5 million, two point five. So, considering that, uh, if the global warming stops at 1.5. Uh, the peak temperature or the lower temperature that uh, Sydney would reach would be uh, like exponentially different than 1.5. So, uh, are you considering such scenarios because people don't uh, renovate their house often? And for example, like if they want to renovate after 30 years, for example, uh, like if, if it stops, if it goes up to 2 degrees. So, what kind of uh, modularity or uh, like how how easily can they change and what kind of like circularity is there in the uh, passive house certified uh, materials that they can do that? Thank you. Okay, so um, look at it too, in terms of just uh, engaging with the straight up question about climate change and increased temperatures and um, the way that we manage that as designers um, is that we get a data set of certified figures for each location that we're working on a house on that we use for our modeling. 